my parents would always mention religion. They would always mention God. You know, they'd say, you know, before doing something, by the grace of God, what we're going to do will, will come to fruition, for example. Um, but we weren't necessarily a, a, a church-going family. So it wasn't like every Sunday we would go to church, but if somebody asked me what my religion was, it was Christianity. I remember something that happened to me around about the age of 12. It was the first time, apart from a day trip to, to France with the school, that I'd actually travelled abroad and it was actually to Nigeria for the first time in my life. And I remember vividly, around about that time, being affected by growing up in the UK and I started asking myself whether or not there was actually a God. because. The society was kind of moving in that direction, moving away from religion. So I too started to question. And I remember going to Nigeria for the first time and, and seeing how important religion was in a country like Nigeria. Be they Muslim or be they Christian, they had this um, very intense belief in God, whatever God, the definition of God would be according to one's religion. And it was at that point in my life where I came to realise that, uh, in actual fact, I myself as well, based on what I'd seen in this country, had now, if you like, uh, had settled the demons, if you like, those the demons of doubt within me, and was now happy and sure of the fact that there was a God. I'm in Forest Gate in East London to meet with Abdul Raouf, a Muslim convert from an African background. He converted to Islam in the early 90s. That's right. How are you doing? I asked Abdul Raouf about his upbringing and childhood to find out more about his background. In the 70s when I was born, my parents had not been in the UK for long. They migrated from uh, Nigeria. And so when they came to the UK, they were still studying and I had three elder siblings as well. So what actually happened with myself and my younger brother, I think from the age of about two to I think seven, if I'm not mistaken, we went to live in a place called Chelmsford in Essex with a white family, basically. So they were technically our, our foster parents. It was a practice that a lot of people from West Africa did apparently at the time so that they could study, look after our three elder siblings, as well as go to work. And I think, you know, my parents were, you know, trying to juggle two jobs at the time as well. So, um, yeah, I think for the first seven years of my life I was living there. Of course, my parents would come to visit and summer holidays would get a chance to come home. But that's the, one of the earliest memories I have living with this uh, white family. So did you have any religion? In your, like, were you brought up religiously? I obviously identified, my, identified myself as a Christian, but um, not, I wouldn't call us super religious. Mm. So religion didn't play a big part in your life as a child? I think it did, implicitly, in the sense that the morality of my parents, the, the do's and don'ts that my parents chose to abide by, I'm sure was heavily influenced by religion, you know. And I know, for example, that my mother always harboured, uh, and my father to an extent, always harboured a dream that when they would go back to Nigeria at some point in the future, they would establish or build a church you know, and so on and so forth. So I think implicitly it, it did play a big part in our lives. Okay, so from going from religion, um, specifically Islam, not being very important to you, for it to it becoming your religion, what, where's the link there? What happened? The link was uh, a good friend of mine, who still is a good friend of mine uh, to this day, um, who basically we used to spend a lot of evenings together. Um, in my flat that I had back then in those days, we're talking in the early 1990s here. And this is how old were you? I was just in my early 20s. Okay. Literally, um, yeah, in my very early 20s, I'd just uh, moved out of home a couple of years prior to that. And uh, yeah, as I said, I had a flat and we used to 
spend a lot of evenings together. And he was a Muslim, Asian, but from East Africa. And uh, he would speak about Islam. And I think the first conversation that I remember, and it must have been the first conversation because normally when somebody starts speaking about Islam as a young guy, if you're not particularly that interested, you know, you would just say, look, this is a boring subject or whatever, politely tell him to let's not discuss this. But what made it interesting for me was the fact that he mentioned how Islam respects Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, peace and blessings be upon him. So for a Christian who had been a nominal Christian, you know, gone to a few places here and there, of course, this immediately uh, caused me to pay a bit more attention now. So then he explained about how Islam respects him, how Islam um, loves him, um, and of course how his mother Mary, peace and blessed be upon her as well, has uh, a great place in Islam. However, the difference being we don't consider him to be the son of God, he said to me. And I think that was sufficient enough for me to become interested because prior to that, my impression, again, another misconception I had was that these two great religions, Islam and Christianity, were more trying to promote a particular individual. Mm -hmm. So, of course, Muslims are promoting Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny, whereas Christians are promoting the Isa, alayhi salam. I'm now finding out that Islam is a religion that doesn't just promote um, the Holy Prophet, the seal of the Prophets, but also Isa alayhi salam. So you have one religion that's promoting both, and one religion that's saying just Isa alayhi salam. So that uh, was, if you like, the hook, the, the, the way in which he was able to get me interested. And then over a series of weeks and probably months we had a, a number of discussions on different aspects of Islam you know so his explanation about Islam wasn't just as a theological idea it was also looking at it in terms of what was happening in the world at that particular moment in time and I think if I'm yeah it coincided as well with the invasion of or the the Gulf War the first Gulf War in 1991 it was all around about the same time that I he around about 92, started talk to, talking to me about Islam. So it all started to make sense. The jigsaw pieces were starting to fall into place. Um, but in terms of myself and my own research, yeah, it was literally a case of I used to go to bookshops, mm -hmm. buy the odd books. Uh, my first Qur'an, or the first Qur'an that I read in English was from my local library, so I went to my local library, picked up um, a copy there which uh, I enjoyed immensely. When did you take your shahada and what was the build up to that? My shahada or the build up to my shahada was quite uh, interesting. I think by this time I'd been, at, been attending bi-weekly lectures at the house of Sheikh Bilal, an Iraqi Sheikh who um, used to basically open up his doors to the Riva community at the time. So I now found out more about Islam, found out uh, about the different sects within Islam and, and been quite comfortable with the path of the Ahl al-Bayt that I was uh, basically made a decision that I was going to follow. And uh, when I started going to these meetings, I then saw that there were other people like myself from a similar background, Afro-Caribbean brothers, uh, white English brothers and sisters, and from different parts of the world who had already taken that step to become a Muslim. Because I think prior to that, I was probably under the impression that I was going to be quite unique. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that helped. Uh, and the lectures that I was going to and the family environment that I experienced there all helped me to... I basically wanted to go all the time. I don't think from maybe when I first started going to when I took my child, I don't think I ever missed a meeting. I think I was always there and needed to be there to find out more about Islam and be with these brothers who had already taken that step and sisters as well. Um, but in my mind, I was delaying the actual Shahada. Why? Because I felt to myself, 
there are too many things in my life that are un-Islamic. And so I need to try and purify myself. And then once I've purified, my, purified myself, I will then take the Shahada, inshallah. That was the game plan anyway. And then I remember one day a dear brother at this particular meeting sat me down and said to me, literally, you know, what's happening? You've been coming here quite often. You obviously like this thing, you're quite eager. So what's happening? When are you going to become a Muslim? And I explained to him about the purification process that I was going through and so on and so forth. And he said to me, basically that was a time waster. In a nice way, he said that was a time waster in the sense of you have accepted this religion intellectually, it makes sense to you. So you should accept it because God forbid if you were to die tomorrow and you haven't accepted it, God knows what could happen. On top of that, all of these things that you're saying you want to try and eradicate by becoming a Muslim will make it easier. And he also went further and said, you know, all of us here, do you think we're all angels sitting here? No. You know, we may still have some areas of our life that need some work on. Um, but that didn't stop us from becoming a Muslim. So I think after that particular conversation, I think I realised that maybe I was procrastinating somewhat and that I needed to make that final push to become a Muslim. And alhamdulillah, I think maybe a week or maybe two weeks, maybe the next meeting probably was uh, when I took my shahada. Mm -hmm. And how did your parents take it? Basically, I think both of my parents were reluctant. My mother was under the opinion that I'd found a young Muslim girl that I wanted to marry, and hence the reason why I became a Muslim. My father, on the other hand, was more of the opinion that why would you want to become a Muslim? It's a difficult religion. It requires a lot of dedication. If you stay a Christian, you can just go to church on a Sunday, once a week. It's all sorted. What was your reply? I don't think I really did reply because I didn't want us to get into a, a, an argument as such. It was more advice for me, you know. Um, because he, in their language, in my mother's, in my mother tongue, um, Islam, the literal translation of Islam is the difficult religion. So they don't call it Islam, they call it the difficult religion. So if you were to say that in their language, people automatically know you're talking about Islam. So mentally, there's always that, that connection with, with, with that. So possibly that was where he was coming from. Initially, as a matter of fact, I wasn't happy. But later on, as I said, from his youth, he has been a very serious somebody. And when he say he wants to do something, he's going to do it successfully. Then I said, well, I mean, you, you, you were born as a Christian. I don't know why you should become a Muslim. But I said, well, now that you said you are, you are, you are a Muslim, then, then you can carry on. Then I'm not happy, but I see how it goes. Mm -hmm. But later on, I become happy in the sense that his behavior and the way it does things, in fact, it's respect to his spirit. Out of all of them, he is the one Everybody is taking care of his mom or dad, but I don't call him uh, Rahuf anyway now. Does take care of both of us. I got married through by going back to Nigeria on my travels to the Islamic world, spe specifically Iran. I'd, I'd met two Nigerian sheikhs studying in Iran at the time. So I knew that they were in Nigeria. And uh, so I basically phoned them up one day and I'd just come back from Hajj, maybe two, three months prior to that, where I'd been praying for a wife, a good Muslim wife, inshallah. And uh, yeah, I phoned them up um, with the view of coming home and, and seeing whether it was a possibility of going down that road, you know, it wasn't necessarily something that had appealed to me before, but I thought I'd give it a try at least. 
And so I phoned them up and went back home. And one of the sheikhs used to run a primary school and my wife used to help teach there. Um, and he had her in mind for me. And basically I went back home. He introduced the two of us with each other. We had uh, an opportunity to speak. But unfortunately it was literally about a day or two before I was due to fly back to the UK because I was only there for two weeks. And so, alhamdulillah, we exchanged numbers and we were speaking for a number of months over the phone. And then I think um, maybe two, three months later, I decided to go back so that I could actually have an opportunity to speak to her in person, which we did uh, over a number of days while I was there. And then uh, we came back. I think my wife did istikhara for herself. And I think I did an istikhara as well. And the light came up good. And so we proceeded to set the date. So maybe six months or so after we'd actually initially met, we, um, alhamdulillah, arranged the marriage. And it's very nice. You could do it also. You want to hold on to it for a bit, yeah? Right. Yes, please. Sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, what this here, it's got a lash. Alhamdulillah, I've been on Hajj twice, uh, two years consecutively, I think two, 2005, 2006, something like that. And I remember at the time having the intention that if I could afford to, I would go every single year, unfortunately. <laughs> I stopped after two years, but that, of course, was a, a beautiful experience. Um, Medina is just a beautiful city and, um, you know, having the opportunity to visit the Holy Prophet. Although you don't get to express yourself in the way you would like because of the, the situation over there, unfortunately. Going to Baqi as well, where four of the Imams are buried. I mean, these places are just, it's almost as if they've left an imprint on my heart. Whenever I think about them, you know, I, I, I can remember the times that I was there. And uh, of course, that was beautiful. Alhamdulillah, I've been to Iraq, I think uh, three times now. Alhamdulillah, so I've go, gone to visit all of the Imams buried there. Uh, and again, um, it's a very powerful place, especially if you go to Karbala during the days of Muharram, which I've had the opportunity to do. Um, very powerful Najaf and of course I mean you know we could go on for ages talking about all of the beautiful places therein. Uh, I've uh, also been to Iran alhamdulillah. A very special place for me Iran because I think well not I think <clears throat> definitely the first ziyarah that I did two years, after, two years after converting or reverting in 1996 uh, I had the opportunity alhamdulillah to go with a group to Mashhad and that was important for me because I think uh, I, up until that point, I'd understand Islam theoretically. I'd maybe experienced, I think, two Ramadans by this point, which is, if you like, more of a spiritual experience. But going to Iran, going to the shrine of Imam Reda, which was obviously a lot smaller than it is now, was very powerful. And when I came back, it helped me to... Um, become a bit more serious about my deen uh, and you know I, I decided to start pursuing a few, some studies in, in Islam as well in a bit more with a bit more uh, urgency if you like um, so it was beautiful and uh, the great thing about that was it was the first ziyara and I hadn't had an opportunity to go back until just last summer to Mashhad um, but during but between the first ziyarah to Mashhad and the second one, just last year, I'd actually managed to do all of the other uh, ma'asumin in between. So going back last year was almost like I'd completed the journey, if you like, and then I was going back to where it started. Um, so, yeah, uh, alhamdulillah, um, it's a beautiful place to go. And of course, I've been to, alhamdulillah, to Damascus, maybe up to maybe 10 times, so alhamdulillah. <laughs>
I felt somehow lost, didn't really know what my place in society was, what my purpose in life was. And Islam, alhamdulillah, provided that. And uh, again, politically on a more wider scale, if we were to look at some of the problems in the world, you know, when I look at where my parents came from in Africa, uh, but of course not exclusive to Af Africa, the whole world, we can see, and I firmly believe that the questions or the answers to the questions that people are asking, you know, good governance and morality and security, etc., etc., and you know, financial prosperity, all of these uh, wants of mankind can be found within Islam. It just needs for us not just to embrace Islam but take it on board. Um, all of its teachings and, and uh, I'm sure without a shadow of a doubt that our lives in this world as well as in the hereafter will inshallah be a lot better. After Laylatul Qad, there is no any night such as this night the night of Sha'ban, half of Sha'ban, Nisr of Sha'ban, half of Sha'ban. And Imam bin Adidan continued, I said, this night, the search is Laylatul Qadr. The Laylatul Qadr relate to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And this night is belong to us, Ahlul Bayt. It's a social gathering basically, alhamdulillah we've just finished praying Salat al and uh, what, what tends to happen is after, afterwards we come for a bite to eat, it's an opportunity for us to catch up, especially for me because I live so far away, I only get to come maybe once every month, every once every six weeks, so it's an opportunity to see brothers that I haven't seen for a long time, catch up, like this brother here I haven't seen for probably over a year, over a year definitely. and uh, yeah so alhamdulillah yeah we chat find out what's happening in everybody's lives make sure everybody's okay and alhamdulillah go home uh, you know with a bit of a boost in my my step inshallah everybody here is a uh, and uh, we're all converts in a way <laughs> yeah, so definitely. everybody is alhamdulillah um, I know some some shady some shady moves have been done in the past but alhamdulillah, yeah, a few of the brothers are reverts to Islam, a couple of brothers are born Muslims. But of course we're all brought up in the UK, so we all kind of speak the same language. English? Yeah. <laughs> alhamdulillah. I kind of do a few things. I, I guess principally I have three or kind of four jobs really. Uh, I guess the bread and butter job is my driving instructing. But in addition to that, uh, I present on an Islamic channel called Ahlul Bayt TV uh, a number of shows. Ironically, one of those shows is actually about reverts, so called Reborn. Um, and, and uh, a couple of other shows as well, <clears throat> specifically to do with Islamic topics. So there's an example, uh, a Q&A session with one of our eminent scholars, scholars here in the UK, Sayyid Muhammad Musawi, and uh, also another show which is uh, predominantly about the tafsir, tafsir commentary on the Holy Quran. Um, I also lecture part-time at the Islamic College. Uh, I lecture on the life of the Holy Prophet of Islam, peace and blessed be upon him and his holy progeny. And uh, inshallah this year I think uh, I'm going to be teaching an extra module on the spread of Islam in Africa. This is for, these modules are for the BA course that is conducted at the college. I also have like a 
Islamic enrichment class with A-level students in uh, ICAS, um, which is another Islamic institution. But this is more, you know, A-level students who are studying just regular subjects like maths, in maths, English, chemistry, physics, biology. But we have like a weekly session where we discuss different Islamic topics that are pertinent to the youth. You know, smoking, tattoos, hijab, how, how one should conduct themselves on, on social, social media sites like uh, Facebook and Twitter, etc, etc. Um, yeah, so that's, that's quite interesting as well because I just try to bring home my experiences as a, as a you know, like to think that I have a, a decent enough connection with the youth to, so that they don't feel like I'm you know, a scholar, for example. Sometimes this tends to put some people off, so the fact that they see me as somebody that's accessible. And the idea as well is that they should feel that they have somebody who they can confide in if they have any 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 particular issues in their life, be it at home or something to do with their religion or their own the way in which maybe they're living their life that isn't in isn't according to Islam. You know, obviously a lot of people would feel very embarrassed to speak to not only their parents but definitely scholars as well. So I try to keep that kind of if you like that line of communication open so that people feel comfortable enough to come to me if they have any issues. There are times of the year where it does get quite hectic, but uh, so far, so good. I'm still, inshallah, relatively young, so uh, as, as, as uh, I was always told, you know, you should try and do as much as you can when you're young because there'll come a time when uh, you just won't be able to do it any longer. So, alhamdulillah, uh, so far, so good. I seem to be coping okay for the moment. I am very fortunate, you know. I'm. I'm in the media limelight, if you like, and I'm propagating the teachings of Islam and the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt. You know, some might consider me not to be that ambitious, but it's like, what else? What else could I really ask for? You know, uh, I, of course, if I if if I felt that I could could uh, do more, or if there was a, a way in which I felt personally I could be more effective within the structure of the media then um, yes that that would also be beautiful um, but to be honest I think I'm I'm living the dream 